Hello and welcome. I'm so glad you're able to join me today and I do hope that you're safe and well. It's been almost two years since the gown was published and in that time I have written and edited another book, uh, done most of the primary research on a book that I'll be handing over to my editor next June, and before the pandemic put a stop to in-person appearances, I carried out more than 150 speaking engagements, uh, library visits, book signings, readings and interviews in Canada and the United States. Now, I have another book coming out in January, so this is likely to be one of the last times I speak about the gown at any length. And so I decided that rather than stick to my usual lecture uh, that tracks the creation of my story from the moment I first discussed it with my editor and literary agent to now, uh, I thought it might be a good time to run through the list of questions and answers uh, that I've been carrying around in my head uh, since I first started speaking to readers like you about the gown. Um, these are the 10 questions uh, you've been most likely to ask me over the past two years. And since you aren't able to put up your hand and ask me anything directly today, uh, as you'd have the chance to do at an in-person event, I'm going to try to anticipate your questions in advance. So here goes. Question one, where did I get the idea to write about the creation of Princess Elizabeth's wedding gown? So my previous book, Good Night from London, ends on VE Day. And I was really interested in what it must have been like to wake up the next morning, um, very likely with a terrible hangover from the grand party everyone had had the night before, and to slowly realize over the days and weeks and months that followed that the privations and sacrifices of wartime life were not going away. The war had ended, but it continued to affect people there was the grief they suffered for loved ones they had lost. There are all the ways their lives had been uprooted and changed. Um, there were their hopes of a better world that they were, they were starting to fear would remain unrealized. The only problem with this as a focal point for a book is that it can easily turn into a very tedious and depressing story. Um, really just one long indigestible rant about post-war misery. Um, what I needed was a counterpoint, uh, a moment of hope amid the gloom, and I found it in the Royal Wedding of 1947. Now, the wedding of Princess Elizabeth on November 20th of that year, and remember that she didn't become queen until 1952, so when I speak of the queen, I'm speaking of her now as Princess Elizabeth. Um, it was the first national celebration uh, after the end of the war, and it came at a time when people were absolutely desperate for something to lift their spirits. Uh, no one believed it would materially affect their lives or change anything for the better, uh, but it was a chance to feel better for just a day, just one day in which the entire country uh, and millions of people around the world here in Canada as well could set aside their worries and indulge in a bit of a holiday. And it was in that contrast between the really dour realities of everyday life and the stardust of a royal wedding, it was there that I knew I would find my story. Uh, question two. Why is Princess Elizabeth, uh, uh, or really anyone else from the royal family, not a central character in the book? So, a fair question. From the very beginning, I knew the queen would not be a central character in the gown. And in part, that's because I wanted the focus to remain on the difficulties of life in post-war Britain. And as much as the royal family made a public and private show of conforming to rationing restrictions, uh, both during and after the war, they, they didn't struggle as ordinary people did. I mean, they didn't have to worry about their pipes being frozen or a shortage of coal to heat the palaces. Uh, the queen wasn't queuing up at the butchers. Nobody was stuffing their shoes with cardboard. Uh, they were sympathetic to ordinary people, but they weren't suffering in the same way. Um, now, it's also the case that in my books, I'm much more comfortable writing from the point of view of fictional characters. Uh, there's many fine writers of historical fiction who write from the point of view of, of known historical figures, and I love their books, but that's not um, my place of comfort when I'm writing. And I think that stems from my need to be in control of my characters. 
over not only their actions, but also their, their interior life. And as much as the queen is a familiar figure to so many of us, she's actually a very unknowable person. She doesn't give interviews. Her closest circle of family and friends never, ever talk about her. Uh, and her opinions on pretty much every subject you can imagine are unknown. Now that's part of her appeal. That's one of the reasons she's so good at what she does. And one of the reasons she's such a comforting and enduring figure to so many of us. But that's also why I knew I could never make her a character in my story. How can I write from a person's point of view if I have no notion of their interior life? Now, knowing that the royal family would remain on the sidelines, I then had to decide where the focus of the book should be. And of course, my attention was drawn like magnetically to the gown itself, as I think a lot of us, any interest we may have in something like a royal wedding, a lot of it is invested in the gown that the bride wears. Um, now, I knew that Norman Hartnell was a designer, but I wanted to know who actually made the gown and the beautiful, long embroidered train. Who was responsible? for the work in its creation. And nobody ever talks about the women who do this work. That's true of royal weddings today as well as in the past. I wanted to put those women at the heart of my story. I wanted to portray them as the talented artists that they were. Now here, I'll add a third question, uh, also royal related, uh, which I get asked very often, has the queen or anyone else from the royal family read my book? And uh, the short answer is, I don't know. It's possible. I don't think it's probable. Uh, I think the Queen's a really busy lady, and I don't think she has a lot of time for a reading fiction, uh, even if it's just adjacent fiction to her own life. Um, even if she had, or if someone in the royal circle had read the book, I doubt I'd ever find out about it. Um, they have to be so careful about what they're seen to endorse and you know it would be very tempting for any writer to run off with a quote from them and use it um, as a sort of uh, advertising slogan so i would love to think that she had read it or might read it one day i would hope she would approve but i really doubt i'll ever find out one way or another uh, now moving away from the royals uh one question i i get asked for this and every other book i've written is what kind of research did i do uh, now, some of you may know that I uh, used to be a, 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 a full-on history nerd. I, uh, in my early 20s, I went to Oxford. I did a, a doctoral degree, or a DPhil, as they call it there, in modern history. And although I had no idea at the time that I'd end up becoming a novelist, I couldn't even have imagined it. I thought I'd end up teaching history. It was actually the perfect training for the work I do now, um, if only because I treat every new book as if it's a potential thesis, uh, much to the, I wouldn't say the annoyance uh, of my editor, but she does have to remind me that I don't have to put the same amount of research into every book as I did with my default thesis. Um, but I love the research in some ways that's, I wouldn't say it's the most fun part of writing a book, but it's certainly up there with the actual writing. Um, I start as I always do, as I did as an historian, as I, as I do as a writer now, um, with the secondary sources, all the survey histories, uh, just to make sure that I have a, a, a fairly wide understanding of the period that I'm talking about. Um, but the real fun begins once I start to dig into primary sources. And these uh, include the kind of more traditional primary sources, such as memoirs, diaries, uh, recorded oral histories or interviews. And then there's more material evidence, which I really enjoy uh, digging through. These are things like advertisements, uh, photographs, uh, novels, um, uh, contemporary novels, I should add, novels that were written at the time, um, movies, newsreel clips, newspaper articles, and so on. Um, and these, this is where I get the kind of, all of the little details that infuse my books with, um, a feeling that you're there, at least I hope uh, they're infused with that kind of feeling. Now, where I ran into a wall once I had really settled into research on the gown was in uncovering the stories of the embroiderers themselves. 
no one interviewed them at the time. And all the hundreds of stories I read about the creation of the gown, only Mr. Hartnell and a few of his most senior employees were mentioned. And although one picture post article included photographs from the Hartnell workrooms, it didn't name any of the women in the pictures. Um, and really that was the only evidence I had of the gown's actual creation uh, at Hartnell. Adding to my difficulties, uh, the Hartnell archives are privately owned and access currently is restricted to a single academic in England uh, who's using them for her own research and is um, not inclined to share access. Fair enough, that's her right, but it meant that I wasn't able to access any of his um, any of his private papers or any um, materials or records from the Hartnell business itself. Uh, so I, I did approach the curators at the Royal Collection, uh, which is the uh, charity that administers uh, the, most of the royal palaces and many of the things within them, and that includes the, the, the court dress or the ceremonial dress uh, that the Queen has worn over the decades, including her coronation gown and her wedding gown. Um, so they were able to put me in touch with an embroiderer who had worked at Hartnell in the 1950s. Um, and I made arrangements. I was going to go to England and speak with her, but then her health went into decline and I wasn't able to speak with her. And it seemed to me at that point, this would be, I guess the fall of 2016. It seemed to me then um, that a door had closed. But the problem was I, I had a deadline, I had a book that was partially written at this point and I couldn't give up. And so I, I, I pressed on, but it kept bothering me that I hadn't spoken to anyone who'd worked at Hartnell. It just seemed there was this big gap. And so at one point, and this was early in uh, 2017, I think, I asked myself um, if I couldn't speak with one of the embroiderers who had worked on the gown, what was the next best thing? And it occurred to me that I could interview someone who does the same work today. Now that led me to a place called Hand and Lock in London. It's more than 250 years old. Uh, and Hand and Lock is a bespoke hand embroidery studio. And they're known for the work that they do for uh, the military, uh, for the Church of England, for the royal family, and also for some of the um, best known London couturier like Vivian Westwood. So I arranged with them to have one of their master embroiderers show me how to make uh, one of the motif from the princess's wedding gown, in fact, from her train. Now, I should add that I do know how to sew, uh, and I used to before I had children and got busy with my work and so on. I used to do a fair amount of embroidery, and I can show one example of something I made when my daughter was born. So this is from about, I don't know, 13, 13 14 years ago. So a fairly simple, nothing like what you see on the wedding gown. Uh, so, you know, there's sewing of that kind, and then there's artistry the artistry you see in professional embroiderers and their work uh, that they do at places uh, like Hand and Lock. And I really was a rank amateur compared to them. So I went to London uh, in February 2017 um, and uh, I spent an, a one long day. I couldn't really afford to stay for longer. I would have loved to, but there was a limit uh, in terms of uh, how long I could be away from my children and how much money I could spend. And I spent the day working on one single star motif, star flower motif with Judiette, who was a young, I think she was 23, a uh, French woman who was one of their master embroiderers. And at the end of the day, I had this, which I've since framed up because I was petrified that my cats would get into it and ruin it. And this is a pretty accurate representation of one of the tiniest of the star flower motifs from the train of the princess's um, wedding ensemble. And I have to say, I haven't embroidered a single thing since making this. Um, what my day at Hand and Lock gave me was not only an understanding of how the, how the work was done, how the applique were attached to the tool backing of the train. For instance, it had to be done invisibly. And that is every bit as difficult as you can imagine. And if any of my stitches showed, 
Juliet made me take them out and do them all over again. Um, but that day also gave me a sense of what it felt like to be an embroiderer, to sit and focus and work for hour upon hour uh, until my eyes were burning and my neck was stiff and my fingertips felt like pin cushions. Um, now, near the end of the day uh, that I was there, a uh, uh, film crew arrived. Um, they were working on a documentary about the Queen's wedding and they'd come in search of inspiration as I had done. And when they'd learned, um, and this was in the weeks before I, I came for my visit, when they learned uh, why I was there and that I was writing a novel about the creation of the gown, they asked to interview me. Um, so they interviewed me. Um, it, it ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, if you want to see the documentary, it's called A Very Royal Wedding. Um, and if you want, you can still watch it here in Canada on the CBC website uh, or their streaming app, which I believe is called CBC Gem. So if I go back, though, to Hand and Lock in that afternoon in February 2017, while the crew was taking down the lights, I started talking with the producer and she asked me about my research and I told her that I tried and failed uh, to find someone from Hartnell to interview and that was when she told me about Betty Foster and offered to put me in touch with her. So Betty. Betty is the last surviving seamstress who worked on the gown. Now looking back I think I must have missed her in my earlier stages of research because I was only searching for embroiderers. Um, and Betty was a seamstress. Um, and, and no matter, uh, I did get in touch with her. I did find my way out to her lovely home in Romford in Essex the next day. Uh, and over a cup, uh, after a cup of tea, uh, she told me about her working life at Hartnell. And she showed me the treasures in her scrapbook. Um, among them were the practice buttonholes she made before she stitched uh, the buttonholes um, down the back of the princess's wedding gown. I think there were 22 of them. Uh, if any of you have ever sewed, you'll know that once you put a buttonhole in, you can't take it out without ruining the fabric. So there was, there was a fair amount of um, tension <laughs> when she was working on them, but she doesn't remember being nervous. Um, she thinks it was because she was too young to be nervous. Now, most of the little details uh, that I include in the gown about day-to-day -day life in the workrooms, they came from my interviews with Betty. Things like the time the women arrived at work, uh, the location of the workrooms within the Hartnell buildings on Bruton Street, the wages they earned, uh, the sort of things they did for fun after work. So it was Betty who took me by the hand and opened those doors that had been closed for so long and led me behind the scenes and into these workrooms. It was Betty who brought that lost world to life for me. And without her, I may have had a book in the end, but I feel as if its heart would have been missing. And if any of you are wondering, I should add, she did read the book uh, and she did love it. Uh, and that was a huge relief. And I've stayed in touch with her and um, it, it's been a delight to get to know her. So I'll move on to my next question, uh, number five. How, much, how do I decide how much fiction to add to my story, to add to my history? How are readers supposed to know what is true and what is false? <sighs> so this is a, a, a big question with likely an even bigger answer. Um, you know, when I'm writing, often I run into blank spaces uh, where little to nothing is known about an event or a certain person. Now that's where the fiction has to take over. Um, but I can't just make up anything um, to fill the gaps in the historical record. Um, I mean, I could, but I prefer not to. Um, I want my books to be believable. I want there to be as nothing, or at the very least as little as possible, um, to pull you from the experience of immersing yourself in what is. Um, uh, uh, hopefully a very believable uh, world. So rather than just make things up and risk getting things completely wrong, um, I ask myself two questions. Uh, first of all, is what I'm proposing to include in my narrative, is it possible? Could it have happened? Uh, do the facts line up? Um, 
and is it possible to kind of to bridge the gap in a way that's realistic? But the second question is, is possibly even more important, and that's, is it plausible? Uh, and if, if a fact doesn't, is possible, but it doesn't seem plausible, it doesn't seem as if it could have happened, then I think typically it's probably not a good idea to include it in the book. So if I can say yes to both these questions, then I'll feel that I'm able to add a fictional moment to um, a narrative that is that is largely based in uh, in the historical truth or the truth as near as we know it. Um, one example uh, I can cite is uh, I'm asked often about the uh, sprig of heather uh, that Anne adds to the princess's uh, train. Um, and in it's it's meant to be a good luck um, charm and so she adds it in near the end of the the period when they're they're working on the gown and it's meant to be a bit of a secret uh, between her and mr hartnell and a few other people so that piece of heather is not to my knowledge uh, on the gown it's something that i did make up um but i did it um only after I'd looked at whether it was possible. Well, certainly it's possible for there to be a tiny sprig of heather somewhere on uh, among the hundreds of, of tiny uh, embroidered motifs on the gown in the train. The second question though was, is it plausible? And there I found my precedent as it were in uh, actually something that happened later uh, in 1953 when the Queen's coronation gown was being embroidered. Norman Hartnell had the embroiderers add a four-leaf clover uh, to the gown, to its skirt. Um, here's a picture of it now. And that gave me um, that gave me the wiggle room I needed to include the heather. One uh, uh, moment in the book that a lot of readers have thought is fictitious actually did happen. Uh, it's the moment when um, the women uh, at Hartnell uh, from the workrooms, both embroidery and uh, the sewing workrooms, the women who hadn't worked on the wedding gown were invited to come forward and add a final stitch, a single stitch uh, to the gown or the train. Um, and in that way, they would be able to say when asked by their friends and family, had they worked on the princess's wedding gown, they could say, yes, they had. And this did happen. Uh, and Betty described it to me. Um, and I found it so moving that I knew I had to include it in the book. Now, I will say, <laughs> I occasionally get cranky letters from people who are outraged that I've woven fictional moments uh, into um, the fabric of history. Um, and sometimes I really, my only response for them is that it is ultimately fiction they're reading. Um, and I really believe that my readers, most of my readers, um, almost all uh, are intelligent and discerning people and that they, you, are capable of understanding that there's a limit to what writers can truly know when they are separated from historical facts by decades or centuries. Um, even things that happened only a few decades ago, we have an incomplete knowledge of them because human memory is fallible. Um, the records we leave are invariably incomplete. And at some point, every writer of historical fiction has to step in and imagine what if. And that's where the magic can be found in the hands of a writer who is not only a good storyteller, but also a competent historian. Um, again, in this vein of is it real or is it fiction, uh, I am often asked if Miriam was a real person. Uh, and the short answer to that question is no. No, Miriam is not real. I invented her, uh, just as I invented Walter and Anne and Heather and Daniel. But for some reason, many, many people have been convinced that she is real. Or if Miriam isn't real, that the Veldif embroideries are real, uh, but were made by someone else and that they exist somewhere in the world. And here again, I have to disappoint you. The embroideries are also fictitious. Now, when I began to write the gown, I knew I wanted one of the embroiderers to be a French woman, 
I wanted her to have that outsider's point of view to add a you know, healthy dose of skepticism to the proceedings. Uh, but I also wanted her to be a survivor of the Holocaust, um, and I'll add to that in a moment, and for her to achieve some level of fame as an artist uh, later in life. Now, I assumed when I began my research uh, that I would at some point come across a French artist who would share at least some of these traits, that someone who'd been a survivor of the Shoah who told her story through the medium of her artwork. But I never did. Um, so I invented Miriam and I imagined her embroideries uh, based on a certain amount of the, the bio tapestries. There's, there's, an, there's some elements of, of them in my descriptions of the, the Veldif embroideries, but also uh, some memories of um, at home growing up, uh, we had uh, two wall hangings that were mid-century uh, applique work uh, that I found really fascinating. And I remember them probably very kind of imprecisely, but they and a few other kind of uh, just vague memories of other pieces of artwork, embroidered work I'd seen formed my descriptions uh, of the Veldif embroideries. Now, what's really astonishing to me is that months after the gown came out, I received a letter from a reader in the United States who wanted to know if I had ever heard of a woman called Esther Krinitz. Now, Esther was a Polish survivor of the Holocaust. Uh, her entire village was destroyed, and she documented her life there before the war uh, in a series of small-scale embroideries um, that are absolutely stunning. Um, and uh, here I'm, you can see just some examples of the embroideries. And if you if you look Esther up online, um, you can you can learn more about her. And she was a fascinating, fascinating woman. Um, now I had never heard of Esther before, um, and so what astonishes me is how similar her work is to my imagined vision of Miriam's Veldif embroideries. So if you've wondered what Miriam's work looked like, I encourage you to search out Esther Krinitz's work um, if, and, and, and so that she can be appreciated for the artist uh, that she was. Now, if we turn back to my reasons for wanting Miriam to be a survivor of the Holocaust, I did not see when I began work on the gown how I could write a book set in the aftermath of World War II and not include the Holocaust as a central theme. I, I just didn't feel I could remain silent uh, or to sweep it aside was inconceivable to me. Now, in Good Night from London, my previous book, it, it's set in World War II, um, and there's relatively um, scant mention of the Holocaust. Here and there, there's, there are a few allusions made by people who have a sense of it who have a growing sense of the horror of the calamity that's occurring in continental Europe. But they, they my central characters in Good Night from London, were constrained by an imperfect and incomplete knowledge of what was going on. But in The Gown, which takes place in 1947, uh, there were no such restraints holding me back from discussing the Holocaust. And that is why uh, I included it in the book. Um, it, it was central to my story. And, um, and it's a subject that I, I continue uh, examining in my next book, about which I'll tell you more in a moment. Um, I really think it's an inexhaustible subject and one uh, that, uh, as an historian, I feel bound to explore. Now, I'm gonna uh, add a little spoiler warning here. For anyone who hasn't finished reading the gown, um, the next two questions, uh, and these are among the, the questions I've been answered, I've been, sorry, asked so many times. Uh, if I had a dollar for each time I've been asked, um, I would um, be using a much fancier computer right now. Um, so you might wanna fast forward uh, through to the point where I'm going to rate, I'm going to um, wave. Oh, here it is. 
I will wave my red poppy. This is actually one of the poppies from the Tower of London, uh, which I cherish and sits, sits on my desk next to me most afternoons. Um, I will pick this up again and wave it when I finished answering the questions with a spoiler. So you might just want to fast forward to the point where you see this again. Um, so we're now at question seven. Why don't Anne and Miriam stay in touch? Um, there is really no simple answer to this question. Um, but just as there's often no simple answer as to why any of us lose contact with people we care about. Um, you know, how many of us still speak with all of our closest friends from high school or university? Uh, it's not because we don't care about them, uh, or it's not because we, we're not interested in what happens to them in their lives. It's because our own lives have moved on, and it's often impossible to recreate the circumstances that led us to be becoming friends with them in the first place. Um, now, where Anne and Miriam are concerned, there's, there's an abundance of affection. Uh, that never dims. Um, but their friendship is one of actually a fairly short duration, uh, not quite a year, and it's severed by a distance that in the 1940s um, is much farther um, philosophically, if not geographically, than it is today. I mean, to leave Europe and go to North America in the 1940s was to go very, very far away and to have very few means of staying in touch apart from writing letters. Um, there was no picking up the phone. There was no uh, Skyping someone. It, it really was a very, the distance was longer and the thread was thinner. Now more critical to their separation though, I should say is the question of the trauma that Anne suffers uh, when she's sexually assaulted and then left to bear a child out of wedlock. Um, now the effect of this trauma or traumas, um, the effects are so profound and wrenching and alienating uh, that they propel Anne across the world in search of a new life. And so when she leaves, propelled by fear, uh, and Shane, uh, she deliberately turns away from everything she knows, everyone she knows, all the people she cares about. And it's not just Miriam, it's people like Miss Dooley and all of her colleagues and friends from work. She truly sees no other way forward. And here the point isn't to say, well, I would never do such a thing, or, uh, you know, why would she feel she has to do that? Um, Times have changed. Uh, circumstances have changed. Uh, for, for many of us, you know, we would not feel impelled to act in the same way. But the 1940s were a very different time and women were judged very harshly. Um, not that they aren't today quite often. Um, but Anne really did feel that she had no other choice. And so I think it's important for us to understand, try to understand what a woman in her position then would have done and why she acted as she did. Um, I should also add that this may not make a difference to any of you who are disappointed that they are separated. Um, I tried to keep them together. I wrote any number of alternate endings in which Anne and Miriam either stay in touch or are reunited and none of them worked. They all felt false and they all felt untrue. Um, and I just hope the final scenes in the book go some way into pacifying you if you're unhappy with the decision I made. Now, a second question, we're now at question eight, and this is in some ways related to the previous one, is why Anne never speaks of her own past uh, to her daughter uh, or even to Heather. Uh, you know, she's really quite close to Heather. And here I think it's important to uh, remember just how reticent people of their generation, of Anne's generation were, uh, compared to those of us who are younger. Um, it was not usual, not at all, to confide in other people. And it was you know, perfectly possible to feel close to someone without ever discussing significant moments, um, such as like a bereavement, uh, an illness, or even something like a profound embarrassment or disappointment. So as much as I wanted Anne to have the chance to tell Heather directly about her past, and I tried writing and it didn't work, um, I knew it wouldn't be true to her character. 
nor to the spirit of the time in which she lived. Um, I just couldn't see Anne turning into some kind of soul bearing, secret sharing, crunchy granola grandma. That, that's not Anne. Um, okay, so we're finished with the spoilers. So I'll wave the poppy. It's safe to come back. Um, just got two more questions for you or to answer. Um, what is my next book about? So my next book comes out in January. Uh, it's called Our Darkest Night. This is an advanced copy. That's the little sticker on the front. Um, this is a real departure for me. Uh, it's my first book that's set outside Britain or France. Uh, and it's the first one where the characters aren't connected, however loosely, to any of my other books. Um, Our Darkest Night is set in the north of Italy uh, during the Second World War. Its hero, heroine is um, Antonina Mazin. Uh, she's a young Jewish woman from Venice, and in 1943, uh, when the uh, when most of Italy is occupied by um, the Nazis, um, she is forced to go into hiding. Now, her story is the product of my imagination, but it was inspired uh, by the actions of my husband's uh, maternal grandparents. Um, who, uh, during the war, were asked by their parish priest to shelter Jewish refugees. And so their priest, uh, here he is, Father Odo Stoko, he was posthumously named Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem in 2010. And, you know, as fascinated as I was uh, by the story of what my husband's uh, Nono and Nona had done, I couldn't stop thinking about the people they had helped. Uh, the people who were forced into hiding. And I, I couldn't stop thinking about what it must have been like for them to have been stripped of their professions, uh, their right to go to school, um, their homes, uh, their right to call themselves Italian. All of that was taken from them. What must it have been like to suddenly have been refugees within their own country? These are the questions I asked when I created Antonina. Uh, when I told the story of what becomes of her after she leaves Venice and finds herself in a humble village called Mezzocel, uh, the translation of which uh, is halfway to heaven. So Our Darkest Night comes out in January. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit my website, which is uh, jennifer-robson.com. Uh, and my last question for today, what am I working on now? Uh, now, this is interesting. Would you believe I have a title for the book I'm writing now, even though I haven't uh, ironed out all the plot details or even named all the characters? Uh, it's called Coronation Year. And what I can tell you so far, uh, although everything is uh, subject to change at this stage, um, this new book is set in 1953 in a small and quite hum humble London hotel, the kind of place you'd walk by and never notice, never think twice about. But it happens to be on the parade route uh, for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II on June 2nd, 1953. And the story revolves around the woman who runs the hotel, uh, her colleagues, and some mysterious goings on involving their guests. Um, I hand in my first draft next summer and it will be published in the middle of 2022, I believe. So that's it for today. I'm so glad you were able to join me and I hope uh, you, I answered some of the questions you may have had about the gown. If you have any more questions though, feel free uh, to email me and you can send it via my website again. It's jennifer-robson.com. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that you and yours remain well and safe in the months to come.